Welcome to Impact Makers Radio, helping you to find jargon-free information before choosing a professional to help solve your problems and live the life you love. And here's your host, Stuart Andrew Alexander. Hi, and welcome to another Let's Talk Divorce Conversation. And during this segment of the show, I have divorce and family law attorney Katie Michelson, equity partner at Beerman LLP in sunny Chicago, Illinois. Now, Katie will be sharing some insights today on a very interesting topic. Katie's here to talk about how to pursue a dignified divorce, both emotionally and financially. So, if you're out there looking for jargon-free information before seeking any form of professional assistance, you may want to, yeah, just stop what you're doing, down tools, find a quiet spot where you won't be disturbed, and listen in to what Katie has to share with you today. So with that said, she's a very busy lady, so I don't want to keep her waiting a moment longer. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome, my dear. Let's just start with a legal disclaimer first. Let's get that out of the way. It goes without saying that anything you share with us today is not any form of legal or therapeutic advice. It's purely for the purpose of sharing information. So with that said then, Katie, can you just expand on that in your own words so that we're emphatically clear about what we're trying to achieve today? Sure. So I think that um, the divorce process is really about trying to give somebody perspective, um, experience, it's not necessarily about their particular legal situation. So I think with this type of interview, the intention really is to get to know the speaker, understand the process, understand the approach, and uh, find out if that attorney ultimately would be a good fit or could provide some type of service which would help people go through the process, but not providing any type of legal situation or excuse me, legal advice as it relates to um, someone's particular situation. Right. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Katie. So please, um, let's start with you talking a little bit about your company. Please describe the yeah the people who you serve um, and some of the common scenarios in which those people seek out your assistance. So my firm is Beerman LLP. And our focus and my focus is really to help individuals navigate divorce in a very dignified way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that really means, because I think that there is a common misperception that divorce has to be angry, it has to be difficult. And I think that the ability to navigate that process with dignity starts with who you hire. And my emphasis on helping people is making sure that they are well represented, they're educated, and they understand what's happening. They may not always predict it, but they do understand what's happening in their particular case. And the types of clients I specifically help are those that are looking for that type of strategic advice and that type of strategy where they can ultimately make decisions on their own and at least feel like they're in charge of the process. Okay, then, Katie. So what would you say, in your experience, is one of the most widespread misconceptions surrounding your industry? Now, I'm sure you could spend uh, quite some time talking about some of those misconceptions, but in the interest of time, just please share one or two that you come across on a regular basis. Yeah, I could be using this entire interview to talk about that, <laughs> no, <laughs> which I'm not no. going to. I'm not, I'm not going to. But um, I can start with probably one of the largest misconceptions I see is that do you have good representation, you have to find an overly aggressive attorney. You know, I, I think that I always tell people that it's really important to find an attorney that fits your personality because it's going to be a very long and intimate relationship. That being said, the client is going through the divorce process. They're going through the change to say marital status or any type of family law issue that's happening, the attorney is not. So while you do want to find somebody who is aligned with your goals and strategy, taking on your own personality and perhaps 
frustrations in interacting with opposing counsel, with the opposing parties, that's not in someone's best interest. So I also think that cases get settled, they get resolved when attorneys direct their clients in a way that's common reasoned. Being overly aggressive doesn't come across well to opposing parties, to opposing counsel. And most importantly, if you are going to appear in court at any point during a proceeding prior to finalizing the matter, it doesn't appear well to a judge. And so I think what I often hear is I need a bulldog. I need a, you know, I need a shark. I need, you know, whatever animal you want to talk about. And and I don't, I don't believe that. I think you need assertiveness versus aggressiveness. I mean, I think being assertive is a huge difference between that. So that's one misconception that I often see kind of being thrown out at me and I have to dispel quite often. So Katie, where where do you think that misconception comes from? I, I think it, it comes from, yeah, I, I'm going to be honest here. I think a lot of people have a, a misconception based upon what they see on TV or what they hear from friends or right. what they, you know, not their own experiences. You know, everybody has a friend who's gotten divorced, everybody who has a family member. And, you know, you hear, I mean, they have movies, they have everything that's going on where people are kind of yelling at each other across the table. So I think the misperception is probably created by a lot of things that we see and we hear. But for those of us who are actually, you know, in the, pro- you know, pro- involved in the process and, and ultimately are the ones who are handling cases, I would say most attorneys, at least most good attorneys will tell you that the yelling and screaming attorneys aren't going to get their way in court and they're not going to be more persuasive. It's the ones with the strategy, the calm demeanor, the ones that are really able to read the room and keep things at a more amicable level. And that doesn't mean giving in. That doesn't necessarily mean not advocating for a client. But I do think that we have to dispel that rumor. And so I think it's, it's, it comes from a lot of different sources, to be honest. Um, mm. and, and a lot of them have influence on us. So let's talk a little bit about some of the advantages of pursuing a dignified approach to divorce, which is your topic today. So what advantages can individuals gain from seeking out a dignified approach to divorce, both in terms of emotional and financial well-being? Well, I mean, I think that ultimately people who are going through a divorce process have a, have a couple different goals in mind. So they want to emerge from the process, one, more emotionally or as emotionally intact as when they enter. Now, I think a lot of people enter a divorce process or a family law process distraught. So nobody wants to leave the process more distraught or more, um, you know, more, uh, un, I'll call it, I don't want to say unhinged, but, but definitely uh, more together. And so approaching a divorce and having somebody who assists you and guides you to approach it with dignity helps maintain that sanity that I think a lot of people feel that ultimately when the process is done, they're just left empty. So that's, you know, that's number one. With the, with the financial part of it, you know, we as attorneys, we're not, the way I would call it is, we don't at work on a contingent basis. So attorneys who are involved in family law process, we don't get a part of a client's estate. I mean, we don't take a portion of somebody's bank account and we to get paid that way for ultimately how we're compensated. So it's really, it, it's really in a client's best interest to maintain as much of their financial resources as possible. And I really believe that approaching your divorce and having guidance where you can maintain dignity, where your reputation is intact, where you approach things in a very mindful way can affect your pocketbook. It can affect your estate ultimately and what's left for not only you, but if you have children or other family members, that's really, really important. We as divorce attorneys are there for a finite period of time. It might might feel like forever, but it is a finite period of time. And at the end of the day, when we're gone, you, the person, and your estate remains. So why not Why not approach a divorce or other family law matter with an eye towards preserving as much of that estate as possible? So if preserving your pocketbook, your estate, um, looking after your family affairs are all dignified ways to approach your divorce, what are some of the fears that may prevent people from seeking out that process and moreover what strategies can they employ to overcome that or those fears 
Sure. I think the fear is appearing weak. Mm. So I think in the divorce or other family law process that people undergo, it's fraught with emotions. So it's not like a business transaction. I think in, in divorce and other family law matters, people have to show their cards a lot more. So we deal with situations where it's not just about, because if it was just about, you know, dividing up a bank account or dealing with the sale of a piece of property or looking at a business and figuring out whether there's going to be a buyout of an interest or what we're going to do with any type of compensation that's a little bit more complicated, part of it has to do with the emotions tied to it Um, because there's a lot of investment that people have made. So when you're dissolving a relationship, there is a history on how that relationship came to be. And so I think the fear is that if people approach something on an even keeled level, they may appear to be weak, or at least think that they would appear to be weak, or giving in, or perhaps not being as aggressive on one point and looking like they can easily be persuaded, for example, to to agree to something else. So I think I think that drives a lot of it. And and I do think that during the divorce process and other family law contested matters, that fear drives a lot of decisions. It drives a lot of actions. And so I think appearing weak, appearing that you don't have a spine or that you're willing to give in by being amicable, being dignified. Mm-hmm. I think people get concerned about how that's going to be perceived, not only by the opposing party, but the you know opposing counsel and so forth. And the irony is, the irony is, especially when you're in court or you're before a judge, because um, at least we know in um, in Illinois um, we have bench trials, so we're not we're not we don't have jury trials as it relates to uh, family law matters um, that are contested. The judges actually prefer dignity. And they look at litigants and they look at attorneys who behave in a dignified manner, I think, with more comfort in how somebody is presenting themselves, whether Mm -hmm. they seem credible, whether their arguments are legitimate. So I think it's interesting because I think we have to, we as divorce attorneys have to dispel the rumor that to be overly aggressive means that, you know, you know your stuff or your position is stronger. What would you say um, would be a good way for anyone listening in who has that fear of appearing weak? What would you say is a good way to overcome that fear then, Katie? Easily, preparation. So preparation, you know, we always with the expression, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. You know, I think that ultimately down the road being overly prepared and, and preparation has a couple of subcategories. I mean, preparation requires advanced work. It requires gathering of information and being as organized as not only during your case, but prior to your case. So that can happen even when you start interviewing attorneys, you know, be prepared, ask questions, focus on how you can be in control of the process, because I think a lot of it is control. So control comes from educating oneself and also being educated by the right attorneys. But education means being in control and ultimately you know, understanding what it is that you're looking for and trying to be organized. So I think combating that fear through that organization, that preparedness is really, really key. And I do believe that we as attorneys have an obligation to show our clients once we've been retained how to be prepared. Um, I have a lot of conversations with my clients. I'm, I'm very upfront with my clients. And I always tell them when I'm, when I'm being interviewed or when I'm, and I, I similarly say I'm interviewing you because you want to make sure it's a good fit, that I'm not going to be just a yes person during the process. We're going to have conversations. And part of that conversation, conversational process is to educate my clients. And then ultimately, they then feel more prepared. And then they understand as we go through the process that you don't have to yell. You don't have to scream. You don't have to file motions that have no basis to appear strong. And so throughout the process, when I'm, when I'm representing them, I think as out of control as people feel during the process, that helps them gain back a little bit of control so that they can keep going. They can keep going through the process. There's ups and downs, but that there's a common theme of being dignified and certainly organized and prepared. Well, is this feeling of um, appearing weak, is that a rational feeling at all, Katie? 
I don't think there's much. I don't think there's anything rational during the divorce process. I think that's a really, <laughs> kind of a hard question to answer. I mean, yeah. I mean, what is what is really rational? I mean, what mm. what what is one person's rational thought is another person's crazy thought. That's you so know? true. That's so true. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's such an individual experience. Um, what I can say to somebody is, you know, this seems like a really rational idea. Somebody can look at me sideways and say, absolutely not. Um, so I think it's a really subjective question. I just I just think we're, you know, as much as we don't want to be therapists, and I always say I'm a very unqualified, expensive therapist, so don't consider me your therapist. <laughs> um, you know, it's we have to kind of we have to treat every case a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And what like I said, what's rational to one person might not be rational to another person. That makes sense. Still had to ask you the question though. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I appreciate it. <laughs> hopefully, I hopefully I fielded it okay. You you did fantastic. Thank you so much. So, Katie, in your in your experience, what is an often overlooked mistake or even pitfall that individuals should steer clear of when aiming for a dignified divorce? Oh, again, do you have about an hour, two hours for me to talk about this? <laughs> uh, every one of my questions are like <laughs> you could spend the know, whole interview on well, one question. I know. I could I could I could talk a lot about these things. I mean, I think um and I've and I've said this a few times, I think every divorce is a very different process for, for a lot of different people. But there is one common theme that I think people need to to really constantly remember. Truthfulness. And truthfulness really is a, it's, it's not a static concept. I mean, I think truthfulness and credibility are, you know, that should always be what people are striving for. And I think that once you lose credibility with a court, with a opposing counsel, with whoever it is that you're dealing with, it's very, very difficult to get it back. Mm. So I, truthfulness from my perspective and Th- that really necessarily means, you know, I, I, I will tell people, you know, never lie in any type of situation, even if something is maybe embarrassing or something that you um, that you think shouldn't shouldn't be disclosed. I can explain away facts. I can, you know, part of my job is, you know, I'm a I'm an attorney that that argues and makes this and, and, and applies law to, to facts. But I make arguments, you know, and I I I, I somewhat in it, you know, as I had stated to you before, I used to work in public relations. A lot of what we do is we, you know, we position things. And when I take facts, I can explain facts. I can put it, I can fit it into where I need to fit it in. But you can't explain away a lie. You can't explain away, and you can't gain back credibility when somebody has um, put it themselves in a position where they're being questioned as to whether, you know, if you if you said this thing now and I don't believe you, I'm not going to believe you in the future. Um, so I think that's really, really key. Um, and, and I just I, I emphasize that throughout any type of family law matter, that that credibility and that truthfulness is is essential. When you talk about truthfulness, then, um, Katie, would something along the lines of um, yeah, withholding information um, from your attorney, would, would you class that as falling under the category of truthfulness? You certainly lose credibility if it comes to uh, if it comes out in the in the daylight, right? Well, absolutely. And how how can we as attorneys represent somebody if they're not giving us all the facts? Mm. Because it's just how do you and and we we have I, I would probably very it'd be very safe for me to say that I've seen it all. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's things I've never seen, but I would say I have a I could write a very long book. I don't because everything is kept confidential and it's kept with me. But people should be understanding that your family law attorney generally has seen most of the scenarios um, of what what is um, often considered either an embarrassing issue or, um, you know, complex. Mm. And this is our job. You know, we didn't sign up to work in this area of law because it's easy. You know, I signed up for this area of law because I think it's interesting. It's compelling. It's, um, it's important. And so to withhold information from your attorney doesn't allow for effective representation. Because if playing this out, if, if a client of mine had withheld information from me and then it later comes to light, how do I explain and how do I weave that into the narrative of what's going on? So I'd rather know. And then we make a strategic decision on, on what we do with it, what we do with that information. So I think that withholding information, you know, we're not just talking about what happens in a courtroom. 
we're talking about how a relationship is perpetuated between a client and their attorney. So, Katie, we've already spoke a little bit about the benefits of pursuing a divorce with dignity. On the flip side of that, what would you say are two to three potential barriers that may prevent individuals from seeking the help of a professional like yourself? Well, I think, you know, there's always, I I would say it it always kind of comes in, in a few categories. One is expense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, and we can start with expense. Expense is, um, you know, I always tell people you, you, you only want to ha- have your divorce done once, which, which is kind of a funny concept, but the individuals who handle a, a divorce appropriately will likely be charging for their, um, services and, and will likely, um, there's a cost associated with it. And when people say, well, I, I, I want to just hire somebody to quickly get it done. Um, or, you know, do it and um, w- with, you know, tr- try to kind of steamroll the other side or do whatever. I think um, it, it's it's to do something quickly that's as important as, say, the dissolution of a marriage and the um, unraveling of a relationship that um, that that has to be considered as, as something that's that's a necessary cost. And the irony is. Um, that actually when people hire attorneys that end up engaging in behavior that's probably less than dignified, it often costs more. So not only what happens is it costs more from, let's call it a motion practice or whatever it is that the attorney is doing, but the end result may need to be redone. And it's not always possible to have that end result undone, or excuse me, redone. It, it, it might not always be possible. However, you know, poor draftsmanship or, or, or something that results from a non, uh, not well negotiated agreement um, often results in um, ultimately higher costs. So I think that ultimately, you know, that might be a reason why people say, I'm, I, I, I would rather, you know, I, I would rather proceed in a different way. Um, I, I think some other barriers um, to, you know, people not wanting to proceed in a dignified matter is they, they have a desire to make, and I'm going to use this expression, make the other side pay, right? So you have, there's like, I, I alluded to this in the beginning of the interview, that there's a lot of emotions that are going on in, in the divorce and family law context. Mm. And um, being nasty and being undignified puts pain on a lot of other players involved. And someone might not want to let the other side get off that easy, you know, and I, and I think it, it is often that um, they don't want to proceed in a dignified matter because it, 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 it makes it too easy for the person who likely they've had some type of fallout with. Um, where I think that um, can hurt people is oftentimes it extends the process. And so it keeps them connected to the person longer. Mm. So if you're, try, you know, if if you are are in a in a situation where your relationship or whatever type of family law issue has to be resolved or anything has to be dissolved, the last thing you want to be doing is extending that process. So I, I always, so so I, I pretty much wanted to give you the barriers, but then also why those barriers really need to be considered and and analyzed, and why those barriers often will. Um, actually work against somebody who believes that they're being employed for the right reason. Right. Right. So could you share an example of how you've helped someone to overcome any of those obstacles or, as you put it, barriers that you mentioned and um, yeah, succeed in gaining the results that they were initially looking for when they hired you for your services. And obviously you have to keep uh, confidentiality in mind, but um, if you could share uh, an, an example of um, that, that would be great for our listeners. Thank you. Sure. So you're correct. I, I'm not able to really divulge specifics of any cases, but I, I do represent a fair number of business owners. Um, I always say that I my my, my ideal clients really are those who appreciate strategy, but they also are, are they, they happen to be leaders in their field, although it's, it's interesting representing business owners and other high performing individuals. 
they're so good at what they do. And yet when it comes to divorce, they're like a deer in headlights, right? So it's, it's, it's totally a different playing game. So I have represented a fair number of, of business owners with some very complicated income streams and asset base. And so the, um, and oftentimes there is going to be in that situation, a non-knowledgeable spouse. And there is an opportunity because the non-knowing spouse doesn't really have an understanding of a business or doesn't have an understanding of how one is compensated, that that information, that there should be some type of game playing and withholding of information or making it a lot less a lot, a lot e- less easy for that person to understand how that person makes his or her money. I've been in situations where I've, I've really had to have conversations with that earning spouse to say, let's sit down in a room and really explain what makes up their income, what makes up the estate. Have a really honest conversation where we're sitting in a room and everything's thrown on the table and showing that the intention is not to alienate, but is to educate. And in that kind of situation, my perspective has been that it is much easier to reach resolution and to feel in control of the process while doing it. And I have found that sitting down and having that honest conversation where maybe the non-knowing spouse represented can ask questions and really try to understand where my client is coming from results on a quicker resolution. It results in somebody's ability to make a decision because most of what we see and the reason why divorces take so long is there's a lack of education, maybe a feeling of a fast one being pulled or or something along those lines, which, which inhibit one party from making a decision. So that to me is thoughtful. It's dignified. It's strategic. And ultimately, it allows for somebody who may not have access to information and may not understand to ask questions. And that makes a divorce happen quicker. Mm-hmm. It allows for things to remain more amicable. And it simply just enables resolution. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Katie Michelson, divorce and family law attorney who has been discussing the topic of pursuing a dignified divorce, both emotionally and financially. Now, Katie, you've provided some valuable insight so far. So let's just shift gears a little and talk, talk a little bit about you. Could you please, um, yeah, give us a brief summary of your personal journey and the experiences or inspirations even that led you to your current profession and the work that you do today? So I have kind of an interesting path. So I, this is my second career and I alluded to this. So when I, um, I went to the University of Michigan um, for my undergraduate education, I'm, I'm from Chicago um, and I am uh, born and raised here. Um, when I graduated from University of Michigan, I came back to Chicago and um, had graduated with a degree um, in sociology. And I was really fascinated by, um, you know, behaviors of populations. And I had thought at some point about maybe kind of focusing on a criminology type of background. But I, I really enjoyed, you know, the written word. I really enjoyed communications. I enjoyed um, uh, the fun of campaigns and and so forth and so on. So I had, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to um, work in the communications industry. Um, so I decided to enter into public relations. So I did a, um, a stint for about seven years, a variety of uh, larger agencies in Chicago in consumer public relations. And, and that was really fun. It was a really exciting, exciting time um, to, to do this. Um, I, Graduated in 1995, and I um, did this for about seven years. And it was a very different time. PR was we didn't have digital media, we didn't have any of <laughs> any of the stuff that we have now. So it was really, really grassroots um, event planning and so forth, and 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 a lot of fun. And I have a lot of great memories. When I right before I turned 30, um, I, I come from a family of attorneys. My father um, uh, is retired, but is a was a well known um, commercial real estate attorney doing transactional work. Um, I, I thought, okay, well, you know, he he tried to convince me to to become a lawyer, and I thought, you know, there's no way I'm doing transactional work. It sounded awful. <laughs> Sorry for all the <laughs> transactional attorneys out there, but it, to me, it just you know didn't mirror what I was doing. That kind of exciting career that I had. So, 
Um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought, you know, now or never, I'm going to go to law school. So I left my career in public relations. Um, and I went to Chicago Kent, which is a local law school here um, in Chicago through the Illinois Institute of Technology. And I went as a full-time student. I was probably one of the oldest students there because most of the older students were doing night classes, but I decided I'm going to get this done in three years. So um, so after um, had you know decided between my second and third year, I was going to um, try and find a clerking position. And so I um, ended up... Um, clerking at my at the firm I'm I'm now a, an owner at. Um, so I started as a law clerk between my second and third year. Um, at that time, Beerman was more of a multidisciplinary firm. We had more than just family law um, as, uh, as our area of law. And so I worked in a number of different areas. But, you know, when I when I started working in, in family law, I just really found a fit. And fast forward, um, I've been with the firm now for 18 years. Um, and I, I went through the ranks from law clerk to now equity partner. Um, there's now the firm is over 50 attorneys. We're the largest in Illinois, and, and I'd like to say probably the country, although I haven't done my research. Um, but there is, I do not know of any family law firms as large and with such breadth of experience as ours. Um, but really found it to be a really good fit for my personality, for my experience, and for my skill set, which drew on a lot of understanding of people, understanding of the importance of communication, um, of, of business and business development. And it's really, really served me well um, to bring me and to form who I am as an attorney today. Um, and so it's been a really, really fun journey um, for me to get where I'm at. Um, and Beerman is home for me. I mean, I've been there a really, really long time and, and we are a family. So, Katie, imagine it's you know, any day of the week and the you know your alarm clock sounds off in the morning. I don't know if you use an alarm clock. I'm just making this an assumption. <laughs> and <laughs> you, you, you know, you fall out of bed and you have a full day's work ahead of you serving your clients that you mentioned earlier as business owners, entrepreneurs, um, leaders in their own space. You have a full day's work ahead of you. How does Katie Michelson feel on a day like that? Energized. I mean, I'm, you know, I get up super, super early because I have um, a 10 and 13 year old and a husband who often travels. So I get up early. I like getting up before everybody. I have a large dog that I have to walk every morning. So, um, you know, I have my, I have my routine in the morning, but I feel energized. I mean, no day for me is the same. So what what's what I feel very lucky about is I have a really interesting job where my you know my work is advising it's helping people figure it out and I'm you know it might not be figured out that particular day but we come up with strategies we we talk about solutions and so it's I I, I somewhat don't know what my day holds um never boring um and and always kind of a plethora of issues you know from divorce to parentage, to prenups, to you know, grandparent visitation, to relocation. I mean, there's so many things that I'm helping clients traverse that I think it's um, it's a really exciting day for me when I when I when I get up, and I and I enjoy it. So, Kate, if you, you work under under the title of um, divorce attorney or family law attorney, but for me personally, the way how I view you. You are essentially a transformationalist because people come to you and they're in situ, let's say they're in situation A, wanting to get to point B, and you're the conduit that makes that happen. So when you're able to help those clients to achieve um, what they were looking for when they initially reached out to you in terms of achieving a dignified divorce, um, both emotionally and financially, what do you what do you get from that? How does that make you feel, Katie? Well, I feel lucky that I get to help people because as people always say to me, how do you help people? They're at their worst, right? So people are at their worst. But then I have to always remind them, but yeah, but then I get to help them to get to their, be their best. Right. Right. So it's kind of, yeah, you know, I think it's a tough, tough job. And it's not always linear. Like it doesn't just go in one direction. There's going to be peaks and valleys and there'll be good days and there'll be bad days. 
But generally, we're getting them to a different place that's often better than where they were because they've come to me and said, you know, this isn't working. Now, even, you know, even if that applies, let's call it, you know, in, in a situation where somebody wants a prenuptial agreement. Yeah, you know, actually, they're, they're not in a worse situation. But what I have done in that situation is I've helped them not focus on something that might have been troubling them. So say somebody wants to enter into a prenuptial agreement, you know, the, the concept of getting married should be a happy one. But then you have something that's kind of hanging over your head. Either you're the person that's proposed it or you're the person who's received it, you know, received the request. Well, in that situation, I've allowed for them by helping them and getting that done, I've allowed for them to focus on on the happy things and kind of take that away, take that angst away. So I see people at their worst and it's a tough, tough job. But then to give them a little bit of relief in whatever form that is, that's really important and it's meaningful. Why is that important to you, Katie? Because I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm probably a, a natural caretaker. I think all of us are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a human being in addition to being a, a, a professional. So I think we all can relate to a human's need to want to feel better and to kind of improve your lot in life. So I think it's just important. I think it's important for us as just human beings to say, you know what? Every, there, you know, nothing's easy. Things are complicated. Relationships are super, super complicated. And if anybody tells you they're not, they're, they're lying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because exactly. Relationships yeah. are, they're super complicated. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with having super complicated relationships. Mm. But I think it's, I think it's important for somebody to have a really good, you know, just to, to, to recognize that, that they are difficult. Right. And, you know, no one has to be better than the other person or pass judgment. And so if I can help that, I think that 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 helps other people. And and for me personally, I think that's important. It's a little bit different. You know, I get some young attorneys and say to me, I, you know, I want to do family law because I want to help people. What does that really mean? Right. So you you what I want to do is I want to help people understand that we're all human beings. That's what's really, really important in my mind. And family law is just a platform that enables you to do that, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm. It's, you know, and, and and I touch more people than probably most professions get to. So I guess, you know, it is a tough job, but it's a lucky job. Right. So, Katie, if somebody is, yeah, they're looking to hire an attorney, a divorce attorney, a family law attorney, call it what you will, what's the kind of criteria that they should be looking for in those individuals when they're looking to select an expert in your domain? So I I, I mentioned this in the beginning. I mean, you want to have a, a personality fit that feels like it matches at least your goals. I mean, I don't think you need to be exactly like your attorney and vice versa. I I think somebody should be looking for an attorney who's going to be honest with him or her. I don't think it's anyone's in in anyone's best interest to ultimately hire somebody who's just going to be a talking head. There has to be discussion. And I always tell people, you know, I want to have a discussion with you, a conversation. This is your life. You're as much in charge of the strategy and discussion as I am. And so I, I want to be able to have an honest conversation with you. So, you know, finding someone who can engage in that matter, of course, somebody who is upfront and honest, whether that's good or bad. So I will not always tell people things that they want to hear. And they sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm providing news that doesn't feel always that great. So being that honest person with feedback, I think, is is important for people to look at. Of course, responsiveness is important. You you want an attorney that's responsive because, and I hear this more often than not, that, you know, we as divorce attorneys have multiple cases, but it's that one person's life. So it feels, you know, while while we say, oh, I have a lot of things on my plate, to the person who's living the life, it's like, it's too long. So, you know, finding somebody who's responsive. And then also, you know, identifying who, who, whether there's going to be a, a relationship that's based on education. I think it's important for somebody to be involved in the process. And, and a lot of that requires an attorney being willing to educate and to inform and to really give somebody some power to feel that they understand what's going on. Those, I think, are some things that are really important for people to look for when they're, when they're trying to hire somebody. 
You know something, Katie? You, you sound so good. I think I'm going to file for divorce just so I can hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> just so I can spend some yeah, time sure. hanging out. With I am you. not encouraging anyone to file for divorce. That's not my hope. <laughs> no, but you, you've done such a great job, and it's um, unfortunate we are coming towards the end of the show. So, with that said, then, Katie. How can anyone listening in right now get in touch with you? And more importantly, what can they expect during the initial interaction? Well, the first question to be answered is, I can always be found through my website. So I, I, I believe you give the information. But I, you know, I, I'm accessible through email and accessible by my uh, direct line, uh, my direct phone at work. And I'm assuming you provide that information. And yeah, if you could go ahead and share that anyway, you know, because sure, some people sure. like to hear that as well as see it on the website. So go ahead. Yeah, of course. So my email address is kh Michelson, and that's spelled M I C K E L S O N at beermanlaw.com. And Beerman is spelled B E E R M A N N Law, all, all one word, dot com. And then my direct phone number and extension to your work is 312. 312- Six two one four three eight two. So those are really easy ways to get in touch with me. And then in terms of what to expect, I mean, I believe a conversation is warranted. It's a get to know you. It's I, I generally like to make my initial consultations very. Um, I like roadmaps. You know, probably like any attorney. Um, so I generally will tell people at the beginning that that the goal is to be one to get some information about their particular situation. Two to talk a little bit about what happens during a divorce. And again, that's with the understanding that it said without, without specifics as of that particular person's case, because I don't have enough information to be making assessments about what should or shouldn't happen, but a really general understanding of what, what it is we're trying to solve for. And then last about my philosophy and approach, because it's really important for somebody to know what kind of attorney I am. And Sometimes more importantly, what kind of attorney I'm not. And so that's generally what I talk about when when I first meet somebody. And then they can make a decision of how they want to proceed and really just kind of go from there. So it's it's a pretty streamlined process. I try not to make it difficult. What's most important to me though is that it's a conversation, it's not a talking to. So you're not going to hit them over the head with a Fred Flintstone club, drag them by the scruff of the neck to the back of your office and steal all the money out of their purse. You're not going to do that. No, you? and I no, and I might not want to. <laughs> <laughs> I might say, after that conversation, I might say, you might even find somebody else. So. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. That's all we have time for today, unfortunately. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to divorce and family law attorney Katie Michelson. Thank you so much for sharing so generously with us today, Katie. You have certainly demonstrated that you are a true educator and advocate for your client's success. So thank you. Thank you so much. You are so welcome, my dear. And I'd also like to take a moment to say a big thank you to you. Yes, our listener. Without you, me, Katie and I would be sat here twiddling our little thumbs and not having anybody to talk to. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy day and for joining us on what can only be described as an insightful and informative conversation with one of the leading divorce and family law attorneys in Chicago, Illinois today. Again, her name is Katie Michelson. Make sure to check her out. Um, she shared her contact details. I'm sure if you do check her out, um, after listening to Katie today, you are going to be in a great place, safe hands and the right place to get started. So that's it for today. Again, my name is Stuart Andrew Alexander. I'm a long lost distant cousin of the British royal family, but they don't talk about it, Katie. Can you believe that? <laughs> <Dear me. laughs> they just they keep it a secret but you know who knows maybe one day it will come on the news anyway we will be back shortly with some more leading divorce professionals in this our series of let's talk divorce conversations so until then take care have a great day and always remember love your children more than you hate each other Thank you for tuning in to Impact Makers Radio. To listen to all past, present, and future industry thought leaders and trendsetters, visit us at impactmakersradio.com.